Caroline Ra, and you're listening to Spirit of the Dawn, Podcast One. Today, we'll be exploring Remapping Your Mind, the neuroscience of self-transformation through story, with guests Dr. Louis Mel Madrona and Barbara Mangai. Every single day since when I wake, I feel the same, somehow I have changed. What do the people of the street? Yeah, made me feel it Somehow life is sweeter every day Somehow life is sweeter every day hey, uh, You've gotta find a time to change Gotta find the time to find this time to embrace The colors, fine lines and shades It makes this place, it makes this place great I'll embrace the change Whoa, 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 I'll embrace the change uh, Whoa, whoa From beautiful Ashland, Oregon, I am Pleiadian Emissary of Light, Caroline Ra. Thank you so much for joining me today. Welcome to Spirit of the Dawn. There are stories about myself that I have been playing over and over again in my head since I was little. Stories that have shaped and limited my experience of self and my interactions with others. When I first began reading Remapping Your Mind, The Neuroscience of Self-Transformation Through Story, I realized I could give myself permission to change these stories. It was a very wow moment for me. I am delighted to have as my guests today the authors of Remapping Your Mind, Dr. Louis Mel Madrona and Barbara Mangai. Lewis is a physician and executive director of the Coyote Institute for Studies of Change and Transformation. He is the author of several books, including Narrative Medicine and Coyote Wisdom. Lewis specializes in weaving the wisdom of indigenous culture into his work as a physician. Barbara is a psychotherapist and education director for the Coyote Institute. Together, Lewis and Barbara bring the power of story as narrative therapy to their patients and they'll be sharing the beauty and power of story with us today. I am delighted to welcome to Spirit of the Dawn, Dr. Louis Mel Madrona and Barbara Mangai. Louis and Barbara, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, I so was touched by your book and I, I thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom. and. I'm hoping, Lewis, that you could share with us some of your early life growing up in an indigenous culture that helped shape your deep appreciation for story. Well, it's interesting because when you're a child, you don't know any different than what's around you. So it took leaving home to really understand that I had a different upbringing than some of my fellow students. And um, I, re I remember stories everywhere. I was surrounded by stories. My grandmother couldn't stop telling stories. And there was a story for everything. There was a story to make you take out the garbage. There was a story to keep you from going out after dark too late. That one had to do with monsters and boogeymen in the cornfield, by the way. Mm. There was a story about... Um, all of the different ways that you could do rat, as she said, um, and some of the ways that you could do wrong. So uh, one just got used to hearing stories from everyone about everything. And so I would say I grew up with sort of a constant diet of story. And um, I, I didn't actually know that that was uncommon until... I got to medical school because I think I was pretty much oblivious through most of college. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't really notice too many other people, unfortunately or fortunately. But um, in medical school, it, you know, it's just the facts, please. And, and what's so interesting about medicine is that the facts change every year. And we pretend that whatever we think today is what we always thought and that it's completely obvious, and there's no other way to think. Um, and, of course, it changes in a year, and, and, and we continue the pretense. We have no sense of our own story, of our own evolution, or of our own history. 
Do you find that knowing about story and the power of story is very grounding for people? I, I think when we understand that everything human evolves in the form of a story and that our human journey is a, a, par is a parallel to the heroic journey, and when we understand that, that all of the information that we store about people is in the form of a story, that, that we can be a bit more reflective that we can say, well, here's one story. What are some other possible stories about this situation, about this person, or about this um, possible decision I might be trying to make? And we can understand that you can take the same seven facts and spin them in 50 different ways, come up with 50 different stories, all of which lead to different conclusions from the same seven um, episodic facts. So um, I think it makes us richer human beings, more compassionate human beings, um, more reflective human beings, um, kinder, gentler, wiser human beings. And if we think we know the truth and whatever we think it is is what it is, and that's the end of the, that's the end. In your book, you describe so much of the neuroscience of story making and storytelling. I have to say that was definitely mind expanding for me because I've never really thought about neuroscience. Story, yes. Neuroscience, not so much. And I learned a lot. And I thank you for that. Can you explain about what is actually happening in our brain and how our brains work in relationship to story? Briefly, you don't have to tell everything. <laughs> Don't have to give the whole book. <laughs> it's really, you know, it's it's uh, it's been a wonderful journey for me because I've always been fascinated by neuroscience, and and I work um, part of my work is as a consult liaison psychiatrist, which is the medical part of psychiatry. You know, in a general hospital where the brain features strongly, and so when I came across brain researchers studying story, I got really excited. And um, there's a couple of convergent pathways. There was, there's a, a group that began in the United Kingdom, uh, um, and they call their work the social brain hypothesis. And, and I hope Barbara will jump in and help me with this. If I, if I forget something, or she has something to add, but they, they had this idea that our brains and story co-evolved and that they did so in order for us to be able to manage more social relationships. And it turns out that there's a mathematical relationship between the size of your brain and the number of relationships that you can manage. So your, your average chimpanzee has a brain that's around 400 grams and manages under 50 relationships somewhere between 24 and 36, I believe. Your average human knows 500 people and has a brain of greater than 1,500 grams. We, we know 150 people well, and we know about 24 to 36 people extremely well. And so this, this social brain idea was that the way we... Um, store information about our relationships is by laying down stories about the people. And so when we need to make a decision about how to, how to approach someone, we, we look at all the stories we have about them and then we simulate a new story based on our best guess about how they'll behave in a particular situation. And in order to do that for 500 people, you need a really big brain, which is what we have and how we got there. And the other interesting thing is that it turns out that the brain is largely formed from the outside in instead of the inside out. So once upon a time, and, and including the time when I was in medical school, we thought that genes were the answer, that the genes created the brain 
and then brain created behavior. And we interacted with each other based on that gene created behavior. Which, which seemed a little strange to me even at the time because it didn't match you know, the Cherokee world that I grew up in. But it turned out that when we mapped the genome, we didn't actually understand anything more about brain and behavior than we had before we mapped the genome. And that the genes just put parts of the brain sort of more or less kind of in the right place. And that it's experience with the outside world that hooks up all the neurons. And there, there were some semi-gruesome experiments with making kittens blind and looking at, at how other parts of their brain gobbled up the part of the brain that's devoted to vision because they didn't have any experience with vision. And so that part of the brain didn't develop. And there's, you can also see this in the, the tragic consequences of Bulgarian orphanages where many children have virtually no human contact. And they're not, when they're brought over by well-meaning potential parents from the United States, they have no capacity to relate as a human being to other human beings. So social experience is extremely important in hooking up the brain. And social experience occurs in as a story, as an ongoing narrative <clears throat> that we continue to add to as our lives with other people unfold. And and then we looked at well, what is what are the parts of the brain that do story? And it turns out that there's a story network that runs down the center of the whole brain, and it turns out to be the same as the social brain network. So social brain and story brain are one and the same because social life is mediated by story and through story. And, you know, we can name the different parts of that circuitry, which is always fun to do. And if people have their Cold Spring Harbor 3D brain app, which I recommend and get no royalties from, they can look these up. But you've got the you've got the medial prefrontal cortex, which is in the front of the brain, and then it goes back to the posterior cingulate cortex, which is getting right right above your ears. It's in the middle, and then you've got the some areas in the temporal and parietal cortex that put together thoughts and feelings, and you've got the the, the poles of the temporal lobe, which do empathy, and um, Put them all together, and you've got a story. Well, and the story brain. Go ahead. Oh no! Continue. It's fascinating. Continue, please. I'm drawing pictures oh, of the no. brain. Ah uh, well, yeah, and you know, I I love my 3D brain app because I have to look at these areas to make sense of them. You know, I, it's hard to hear about them and, and make sense of them without looking at them. I think that's why I'm drawing pictures. <laughs> Should we talk a little go. bit about the uh, the um, the default brain and also the the idea of scanning for change? Do you want me to explain a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, so, definitely, yes, definitely. I'd I'd like to hear about that. I'd like to hear about um, when people come to you with a physical malady and how you. Uh, you know, maneuver around things and weave story into it. So please continue, Barbara. That would be fascinating. Yeah. So, so on top of of what Lewis is talking about, there's this this neat experiment that they did. I mean, stories because we use our brain for stories, and because it's what we do when we're in a state of relaxation, it takes more blood glucose to meditate and to turn off the story-making circuitry than it does to tell stories about the world around you. And stories have a way of uh, making us feel safe. So we tell ourselves a story about how the world works and where things fit in and where people fit in and how they react to us. And it makes us feel like we know a little something about something. Even if it's not a lot, it's a little something about something. And it turns out that, that human beings really like that feeling. 
of knowing a little something about something in their world. And when that feeling is disturbed, when something changes, that's when we experience anxiety, which which in and of itself is, is not abnormal. Anxiety is simply the feeling that you have when your world starts changing. But the but the nervousness around anxiety drives us drives us around the twist. And that's what really kicks us into all kinds of patterns that, that don't really serve us that well. And they did a really neat experiment where they they had people uh, wired up, they had their brains wired up and they uh, had them sit in an environment and listen to a story. And they measured whenever their brain kind of lit up like they were paying special attention to something. And then they uh, read them the same story, but this time they instructed them to take a note of any time there was a change, any kind of change, change in status of a character in a story, a change in the outfit, a change in direction, a change in the room, any kind of change. And it turns out that their brains lit up at the same time. So what they figured out is even without being instructed to do it, we automatically scan the world for change. So we're sitting here, we have our usual story about the world. I know that my dog is sleeping. I know that uh, dinner, you know, I've got to start to uh, maybe roasting the vegetables. If I want roasted vegetables, I've got my world kind of mapped out. If I hear a large crash, I immediately start processing that large crash in my meaning making system. So my story brain starts coming up with a story of that large crash. And I begin a process of elimination of some ideas. So I hear a large crash. There's no glass anywhere, nothing shaking. I go, okay, it's probably not an earthquake or an explosion right outside the door. Um, and I begin to kind of sift through my data set that tells me about large crashes. And I could get up and go and look as well until I arrive at a theory about what that large crash was. And that makes me feel comfortable again, and I can go back to being on automatic pilot and start thinking about how I'm going to roast the vegetables. And this effort, this, this, this idea of scanning the world and including change into our story really is, is a kind of example of, of how we adapt in the world and what we do uh, all the time when we're going through life. And sometimes this happens on a bigger scale than others. So sometimes it happens on a small scale when I'm trying to figure something out, you know, like what that thump was. And sometimes it happens on a gigantic scale, like if I'm trying to figure out why I've lost someone dear to me. So what happens when people come and see us is they come and see us with broken stories, with stories that uh, felt good for a long time, that seemed to serve them, that seemed to be automatic, that seemed to keep their lives running. And then something happened and something picked apart that story or, or it turned out that their story making wasn't that successful and the story they were telling themselves about the world didn't provide them with a very safe and comfortable feeling about how the world works. And so what we look at is how your story about the world is working and can we do anything to help you adjust it, to help you find a way to, to uh, rework your story so that you can feel better again and safer in the world. So Barbara, when something happens in someone's life, is it then a kind of a uh, quest to then uh, reset their lives in a way so they cannot live in a state of anxiety and nervousness so that they have to kind of grow in ways? Yeah, you could call it growing and it's really being finding ways to negotiate um, some natural nervousness. I mean, we all have a little natural nervousness that we need to probably learn how to be with in a, in a comfortable way. Um, cause without it, you wouldn't be prepared for things in the world. Some people are, are a little hyper when a teacup handle, it goes in a different direction than the other. Some people are, are wait to get, uh, get excited till, you know, things start crashing around them, but everybody feels it a little bit. And definitely we want to, uh, usually, uh, we seek a state of calm. We seek a state of peace and of comfort and of safety. And so when something changes in somebody's world or something isn't working, it can get really, it can feel really miserable and it can feel really hard. 
and and we definitely want to help people find a way to feel better, feel better in the world. And that requires sometimes going on a journey. And a story is a journey. A story follows the map of a journey because it's like if you imagine the safe story as kind of the safe kingdom, when something happens to, to take the kingdom wall down, we now need to go on a journey. The hero goes on a journey to figure out how to rebuild that wall. And so that's what, uh, what story making is. It's, it's going on this journey of gathering the pieces that you need to reconstruct a story. That so is, that, yeah, that is really wonderful. Um, Lewis and Barbara, when, when, someone, the hero, when the hero of the story enters your office, what happens next? Well, mostly they don't know that they're the hero of their story. So I think a, par a big part of our work is to help people to transform from feeling like victims, um, trodden down, um, beaten down, hopeless, um, <clears throat> to feeling heroic, that they can do something that will have a positive impact on their lives. And, and once you feel that you can have a positive impact on your life, then you can start taking little steps toward making change <coughs> and, and going in the direction that you want to go. And uh, in the book, I believe that you say the story of illness is animated in the physical. Could you explain that? Well, I would say that we don't we don't actually live apart from our bodies. <clears throat> that we're actually living in our bodies and through our bodies. <clears throat> so that the story that we're enacting in the world is is embodied and the effects of that story will be felt in our bodies. So an example from a patient that I saw yesterday. So um, here's a woman who is is having all kinds of intestinal complaints and um, headaches and back pain and neck pain and <clears throat> what she calls depression and and she comes in for medication to make her feel better. So it turns out that that she works as a paramedic. And that um, to make a, her longer story shorter, she has this idea, the plot of her story is that if she tries really hard to control everybody else's behavior around her, that things will go well. And if she lets up on her vigilance at any moment, something bad is going to happen. And so the, some examples of that... Um, her father was in the hospital. He came, he was supposed to go to another hospital. He came home um, for a night without her knowing that he wasn't supposed to, and he died. And she just criticized herself severely for not knowing that he was supposed to go to the other hospital and not come home and spend the night. Now, when we looked into into this story, it turns out that he was going to hospice from General Hospital. And so, I mean, it, it was sort of sweet that he came home and died, as opposed to going to hospice to die. But that's not how she interpreted it. And and so she had another another example for her was her husband had her husband was sleeping around having these one night affairs. And, and she believed that if she just kept closer tabs on him and, and just kept him in order better, that he wouldn't do that. And then, lo and behold, he had a stroke. And, and then she felt that if she could only keep better control of his lifestyle, that he wouldn't have another stroke. And, and it just goes on and on and on. And so, so her story is about controlling the world around me so everyone does what they're supposed to do, and I don't feel anxious. Okay. You know, as Barbara was saying, um, you know, we, we, we don't like feeling anxious. We want everything to be certain. We want to know what's going to happen. And, and so, 
you know, the story that she's living um, is is a, is physiologically grating on her. It's 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 one that wears down the body, and and it's a you know if you're in hyper vigilance all the time trying to control other people's behavior, then your sympathetic nervous system is always on override and and you never get a chance to go parasympathetic, which is rest, repair, recuperate. So um, if you go sympathetic all the time, you're going to break down and you're going to get ulcers and you're going to get headaches and you're going to get neck pain and back pain and, and lots of other misery because you're not repairing and restoring. So, so, that's what I mean by the story that we enact is embodied, that our bodies bear the consequences of the performance of these stories in our social lives um, because they are performed through our bodies. And, and if, I wanted, you know, if, if I wanted to help or change that, I would have to facilitate her movement toward some awareness <sighs> That she can't control everything around her. That that it's I think of it as Lakota existentialism. Um, in the, in Lakota, it's, the word is wa'onshina. It's that notion that the world is a big, scary place, this place with forces that are out of our control, that aren't necessarily friendly toward us or even aware of us, and that we kind of have to get on with it anyway and make the most of it, make meaning and purpose despite these forces that work around us. And, and um, you know, I think um, that's a lot of the insight of Buddhism or, or um, some forms of psychotherapy that, that we have to radically accept that we can't control the world. We can't even control our little corner of the world. That we can't even control our family members and friends. And, and when we try to do so, things don't turn, turn out so well. People don't do what we want. But, you know, you can, you can per perpetually redouble your efforts to perform that story and get sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker. And the, and the more stressed you get, the, the, the more quickly you move toward a diagnostic label, fibromyalgia, you know, cervicalgia, um, anxiety disorder, depression, you know, the list goes on and on, chronic headaches. So, um, so that's what I mean by saying that, th that the story is embodied. Well, thank you. That, that totally, I understood that. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, something I love that you guys do is you bring theater to your therapy with, um, groups acting out people's stories and puppetry and movement. Can you tell me about that aspect of the therapy that you do? Uh, yeah, this is, you know, theater um, has always been a form of healing. And uh, there are countries where performing stories is actually the, the medicine that's offered for different conditions. And I think, you know, it's a very interesting form of medicine. And I think that, that it, what it does is it allows, uh, it allows you to bring a new story into your body. So it, it, or it allows you to um, see things about an old story that you might not see if you just recount it in words. So it, it's, 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 very helpful sometimes for people to tell a story uh, without words, to tell a story in, in movement, to tell a story in dance, to tell a story um, in, in paint. And uh, it, it helps to um, gain insight. I mean, honestly, when people do that kind of work, they often find things out that they that they didn't imagine they could find out. They find out things about what's going on in their world. And so working at it from both sides, taking an old story and allowing people to enact an old story and then taking a new story and having people kind of rehearse a new story it are very powerful things because it, it brings it into the body in that energetic way. So in the same 
way that our suffering is encoded in our body, we can we can work to shift the, the codes that our body holds. And uh, there's there's a lot of different modalities that really address this. Um, dance and movement therapists address this. Uh, a lot of body workers kind of have a feeling about that kind of thing. And then we do it through through drama, through really um, creating this fake for someone's story to be, can be contained in a physical expression. And we do it very carefully because we really understand that, that even if a story isn't working for you, even if a story is something that you arrived at by a circuitous route um, with many understandings that, that are, are, uh, are not necessarily helpful, um, it's still a story that was really carefully constructed for you. You know, we, we tell the story of the world and its meaning to us, not 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 loosely. We don't do it um, quickly. We do it over time and, and in a very deep and rich way. So even if it's, it's like a kid who tells you a story, it may sound kind of bonkers, but it's actually really coming from quite a profound place. So we're very respectful of stories, even the ones that, that aren't necessarily working. We're very respectful of them. So we create a very... Um, we prepare the space that we're going to do the story work in. So when we work physically, when we work with theater or puppets or anything, we, we are still very careful of the space. And the other aspect of, of doing it with uh, drama, bringing drama into it, is that often our bodies are quicker to respond than our minds are. So our bodies will do something take a pose or have a reaction and it can be more more quick to happen than it would be if we were actually sitting in a conversation with somebody and explaining things and so it's interesting to uh to experiment with things like improvisation and to find that our clients are really often surprised by what comes out when they're when they're improvising because you can't really uh, correct your body. You can't contain it necessarily as quickly as you can put a lid on something you were about to say. So it, it can it can help people kind of slip on the banana peel into taking this next step forward in their lives because it, it just kind of allows you to open up an area that's harder to clamp down on. And in fact, improvisation is used a lot um, in, in different kinds of uh, therapies and we we use it a lot because it really does elicit this spontaneous response that can be very successful in helping you see something that you might not have seen before. And the other thing um, that improvisation provides is play. And Lewis can talk more about this, but it really turns out that our our bodies and our brains and and our ourselves really need play. And play is how we put together new ideas. So the other aspect that, that uh, drama and puppets and uh, physical things and, and uh, improvisation offer is a sense of play, a sense of being able to take a new idea out for a ride in a way that allows you to just really kind of toss it around and see where it might work. And play is not, um, is not necessarily uh, frivolous. Play is a very important aspect of, of how we... Uh, how we look after ourselves and how we move through the world because it gives us this chance um, to experiment. Louis, I don't know if you have more to say about that. Well, I think that if you look at brain development, that play is crucial and that play is how we find, play gives us the capacity, increases our capacity to find novel solutions to common problems. I mean, at least this is what the research shows. And so um, when we play, we are using our imagination, which allows us to find new solutions. And we can play with words. When we do guided imagery or visualizations, that's playing with words. We can, we can play with objects, which is puppets, masks, you know, um, we can play with characters like in writing and, and we do a lot of writing exercises with our clients where we, we encourage them to play with puppets 
of set puppets to play with the characters that are familiar to them. And and one of the things that's been really wonderful is this new movie, Inside Out, because it, it makes it so easy to talk to people about the about the characters who live inside their mind. Because this, this, this new Pixar Disney movie is all about uh, um, the dialogue that goes on inside your head among the characters who are um, arguing about who should be in charge of your behavior. And, and so, um, you know, it's the story that's going on inside the story, so to speak. So in writing exercises, sometimes we can have these internal characters dialogue with each other. And, and that evolves as a kind of playfulness in which new ideas appear that weren't there before. Stories seem so important to all of us um, through movies, plays, uh, stories that we've been told or stories we remember. Um, can we talk about the power of story in uh, transforming community and also transforming things globally? I, I think that's crucially important because, you know, po politics is really the negotiation of story, of which what's going to be the controlling story that we're all going to live? And, and what are the degrees to which minority stories are allowed to coexist? And, you know, we've seen that in the United States recently with the gay marriage. You know, so there is a story that exists that says that only uh, biologically males and biologically females can get married. Uh, apparently that's especially strong in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And and then there's, there's another story that says, hey, anyone should be able to get married. You know, the, the divorce attorneys are not making enough money these days. You know, let's give them some more business. Let everyone get married and get divorced. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm saying this humorously. I, I I'm smiling. To, no, I'm smiling. <laughs> but, I, you know, I mean, seriously, every, you know, I, I totally agree that everyone should have the right to get married. And, but that's, that's been a minority story that's now become the majority story. And, uh, you, you know, you can't get married if you're not, you know, male or female as is moving into the minority. So that's, that's a shift in story. And, and here's another example. And, and I'm grateful to Bernie Sanders for pointing this out. Um, there's a story in the United States. It's called the trickle-down theory. It's a story that says if the rich get really rich, then their wealth will trickle down to everyone else and everyone will feel better. Well, it, has, it, it didn't work. Um, it hasn't worked. Um, there's ample data you know, to show that it doesn't work. And... Um, the, you know, but, but the people who belong to that story continue to push it. And then there's another story that I think um, Bernie Sanders represents, the uh, senator from Vermont, which is that we need to find a way for the poor to be less poor, maybe at the expense of the very rich being somewhat less rich. And, um, and then we've had this really interesting turn of events in which the Roman Catholic Church has gone political. At the, at the Pope, apparently, if I understood the lecture correctly, uh, gave a speech in which he talked about um, the greed, you know, that's pushing forward global warming, being sinful. That it, because, because the consequences fall largely on the poor and not the rich. It's the poor who die from extreme climate change, and not the rich. And and so um, so the story that the rich get to do whatever they want to get richer at the expense of the poor, which is a um, strong story in the United States, is being um, there's a counter narrative arising that's saying no, um, that's not an ethical story that getting rich, getting richer at the expense of the lives of, of poor people is not a just and ethical thing to do. And what's, so, interesting, so, what's interesting too is that it's a new character telling it because the story's been around 
Um, but it's been in the voices of people who don't have the kind of power that the Pope has. And so it's a very new situation for the Pope to be telling this story and and being the authority of the church, being telling it from the top down and and aligning himself and making that connection um, for people. And I think before that, we couldn't imagine that that would happen. And I think that's something that's really an interesting piece of this is, is that we, we are often restricted to our in our imaginations there's things that we think well i could just never imagine that happening and when we're feeling despairing about life we we just feel very limited in in what we can imagine and our imaginations are tremendously powerful in helping us create new realities and it's very interesting that, that this pope is imagining the church in a different way that the Catholic Church in a very different way than people have gone before and somehow allowing himself to retell the tale of it, to create the new narrative for it. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Lewis. I just um, wanted to say oh, that. Oh, no, 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 that was, that was perfect. Uh, I, I think that's extremely important because organizations have stories. And we were talking about countries have stories about that defines them, identity narratives. And, and um, so do organizations. So the Pope is, is really working to change the story of who the Roman Catholic Church represents and, and what is the purpose of the church. And, and, um, Excuse me, there's someone. You know, once upon a time, once upon a time, the purpose of the church was to save souls. And it didn't matter what happened politically. Um, but but that's changing. Well, it seems that it's very, very major when leaders that people are listening to, groups of people, large groups of people are listening to. We kind of have a hive reality and a hive story, and there's things that we all learn about and know about and when that is raised when the vibration of our story is raised uh we all have a chance as a global community to grow and transform and i was that was you know it seems that the pope and bernie sanders and others um who have a large audience uh can raise the vibration of our hive story that we share Yes, and, and I think it's remarkable that some of these stories of compassion and, and um, protecting the, the poor and the downtrodden are, are getting airplay now. You know, the American dream has been about everyone has equal opportunity to get rich and, and, and then take advantage of those who don't. And, and we're becoming aware probably everyone doesn't have equal opportunity to get rich and probably we do need to take care of each other and that's an awesome thing you know it it's just completely awesome that we're becoming more compassionate i think i hope i believe i think definitely that that overall we are becoming compassionate yeah yeah I think that the world's yeah. transforming in a lot of beautiful ways. And I, I, I guess I feel that's why we're here is to experience and participate in our own personal transformation and the global transformation. And I think it's a very beautiful, beautiful time to uh, be here and to um, be a part of that. Right. So, uh, right. I have had such a lovely time today talking with Dr. Louis Mel Madrona and Barbara Mangai, who are the co-authors of Remapping Your Mind, the Neuroscience of Self-Transformation Through Story. And I invite everyone to visit Louis's website, melmadrona.com. Louis, is there another website also or Barbara that you have that you'd like people to visit? There's a Coyote Institute um, Facebook page, which is um, a really good a, a good way to find out um, events and things like that. 
And a coyoteinstitute.us is the Coyote Institute page. And that's our not-for-profit. And we do everything. Um, when we teach, we do that through them. So if people are interested in coming out, we always have a sliding scale if we're in charge of the event. So we welcome, welcome people to come and talk story with us. That sounds beautiful. I'd like to ask you guys to share some closing words of wisdom with us today. Well, I would say... Um, Use your imagination that, that we, we, we don't have any faculties that are given to us um, just, just as, as, as artifacts or for, you know, just to watch Disney cartoons. We have this tremendous power to create the world in the way that we want to by holding it in our imagination and believing that and uh, that it's really important to develop that and use that, uh, use that sense. Imagination is the seventh sense. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Barbara. And uh, Lewis? You know, well, I, I think the most important thing for me is to remain aware of how much we need each other. And that we're really not designed to exist in isolation and independent from each other. And that, that, that we're really called to be with each other and I'm drawn to the studies on forgiveness, which show that they're more physiologically powerful for the person doing the forgiving than for the person being forgiven. And so being compassionate is powerfully healing for us. And I'm, I'm drawn to the idea that, that we should make an effort to get together with each other simply for the purpose of being healing for each other on some regular basis. That sounds tremendously beautiful. Compassion and imagination. I thank you, Lewis and Barbara, so much for joining me today. And I express deep gratitude to everyone who has joined us. A big thank you to Brian, Zach, and Synergy for the amazing music, Embrace the Change. I am Pleiadian Emissary of Life, Caroline Ra, sending love from my home to yours. Thank you.